Hello everybody, I'm David. I'm part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We are co-hosting this uh, peace webinar with uh, SCM Bangladesh. A special hello to Monica. And I really appreciate all of you being here. It's amazing that we can come together like this. I just want to do an acknowledgement of country. In Australia, we have a tradition where we sort of acknowledge the Indigenous um, leaders, past, present and emerging. And of course, we're talking about peace and conflict, and that is something that uh, Indigenous peoples have, have to deal with as well when they've interacted with us. Now, just to give you an idea of what's going to happen, this will be for one hour. We're going to hear from uh, John Langmore first, then we're going to have a group discussion, and then we're going to hear from students from Bangladesh, students from Australia, another group discussion, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. You can type it in the chat box if you preferred. Uh, we're just going to start with an opening prayer from Robbie, who's part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. Let's pray. Loving God, we uh, pray in this time of war, we pray for peace. As we watch with horror the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we think of the word of Jesus Christ as the Prince of Peace and uh, how insane it is to see war that we thought was a thing of the past for Europe uh, recurring. So we pray for the blessing of God upon our student Christian movements in Bangladesh and in Australia and as part of the broad family of the World Student Christian Federation. We pray, Lord, for your presence among us this evening to inspire our conversations and help us to work for peace. Amen. Amen. And I'd like to introduce our uh, first speaker, John Langmore, who is based in Melbourne, a senior friend of the Australian Student Christian Movement, has done a tremendous amount of work for peace, actually helped start a peace uh, centre in uh, Melbourne. Thank you, John. Well, thank you very much, David. It's a privilege to be with you, and I thank you for the, for the invitation to be with you. Uh, it, it, it's um, particularly appropriate to be talking about peace today, isn't it? The day after uh, the first war in Europe since, since 1945 has begun. And maybe we could talk for a few, just, just a, a few introductory minutes about what that event has to teach us about, about what's required to achieve peace because uh, that, that situation is clearly partly the result of the rigidities of, of several parties for reasons that have got not much to do with the, the dispute itself. Uh, the, the president of, of Russia uh, clear, clearly wants to draw attention to, to Russia. He wants to, to win attention for Russia, which has been becoming less important uh, as China has grown strongly. Um, he's been asserting uh, things to do with the history of the link between Ukraine and Russia. And, and that's an example of one of the central features of conflict, which is often based on, on traditions of one kind or another. And one of the aspects of good conflict resolution effective conflict resolution is to study and understand and empathetically understand the background to the conflict that's occurring. Uh, and there's, there's been very little evidence of empathy in this conflict between Russia and NATO represented by the United States. Uh, and another another aspect of this is that the you, you, the you, Ukrainian uh, 
side of the debate has been heavily uh, influenced by and and sometimes represented by, for better or worse, uh, other countries in Europe and by particularly by the United States. And that shows the complexity of negotiation. Uh, and one of the problems uh, of conflict is often to identify who are the influential parties in a negotiation and, and what are the factors that are driving each of them. And that can often be quite a complex uh, dynamic understanding if it can be achieved. Uh, in, in this one, it, people on, in the US and in Europe uh, tried hard to, they said, to ne ne negotiate with, with Russia, but they weren't prepared to compromise over the issue of whether uh, there should be a prohibition on Ukraine uh, joining NATO. Uh, now, th that's for, the, for, for Ukraine to decide, but certainly some people were concerned that there was not flexibility, any degree of flexibility at all uh, on, on the Ukrainian side of this negotiation. It, 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 it can be said that if there had been some willingness to guarantee that Ukraine would not have uh, been admitted to NATO indefinitely, then it's, it would have been very hard for Russia to justify the invasion that's occurring. And, and there is a question surely of priorities. Was it more important to, to maintain that rigid position about Ukraine having access to membership of NATO, or was it more important to try and achieve peace? And there could clearly be a case for the second of those. Uh, that's, that's a case for the people concerned to make, but in trying to understand that conflict, it's important to take account of the fact that both sides had rigidities which could have been more flexible if they had decided to make them so. A problem for America, which took on itself uh, a major role of negotiation was that uh, President Biden uh, sees himself as in a weaker political position within the US than he would have liked to be. And he wanted to appear as a, as a strong negotiator. And that would be harder if he had been prepared to make a compromise. So there are issues of pride, of, of rigidity, of history, of, of conflict within, within each side, as well as conflict between the sides. And that's an example of the complexity of trying to achieve any kind of agreement which could have prevented violence being used. Now, it, there's no guarantee that if there had been some flexibility on the Ukrainian side, uh, would that have made it very difficult for Putin to, to invade? It would have made it more difficult for him. Uh, it, 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 is, it is arguable, of course, that what he is doing is counterproductive from his own point of view, uh, if it, by invading, he is bound to antagonize 
a large proportion of the people of the Ukraine. And uh, because he will be involved in authorizing military action, which is going, which is killing already uh, hundreds of people and, and, and which will continue to do so as long as the conflict continues. Uh, it, it, it is surprising to many of those outside the situation that Biden, that uh, uh, Putin seemed so determined to, to invade. And, and he didn't seem to understand the enormity of the opposition that what he is doing will create. Uh, that means that he was not well briefed and apparently he's, he is not well briefed. Apparently he's got around him a coterie of, of loyal followers who, who don't uh, stretch his understanding of the situations that he's dealing with. And that's very, a very difficult counterproductive uh, situation. But that's, that points to the enormous importance in that situation of the attempts at dialogue between France and, and Russia and Germany and, and Russia, uh, who could have pointed those kinds of things out to him, whether he would have listened or, or believed them is another question. But but that would have been an effective aspect of the case that they put to him. Anyway, look, that all of that uh, are, are, are comments on one situation, just because it's enormously on our minds at present. I want to make some, a few just very general um, uh, principled points about peace building. Uh, it, and I won't go on too long, David, uh, but, but, but first of all, surely peace and justice are goals that any practicing Christian, but any person of common sense as well, would, would, would want to have high on the uh, structure of awareness of national interest by any country that wanted its own citizens to not only improve their well-being but even to survive. Uh, anyone who's read the Bible will, will be, or parts of the Bible, will be aware of how commonly it talks about peace and justice together. And many of you will remember that when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, met his disciples again for the first time after the resurrection. His first remark to them, as reported in John's gospel, is peace be with you. In other words, the goal of peace is a central goal for any practicing Christian. But I'm glad that we can recognize also that it's a goal that the majority of people in 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 every country that I'm aware of would also concur with. M most people do not want war. They may be aware of the courage of their soldiers in certain war situations, but that does not justify in any sense stopping seeking the goal of peaceful conflict resolution. And as Christians, we have a a particular commitment to that, but we can also recognize that most people would concur with what we're trying to do. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means searching for ways of understanding the conflicts that are occurring. And that means the use of empathy in in attempting to understand both or all the parties to a conflict. And uh, 
That's a goal that all of every single one of us as a person can aspire to. Empathy is a, a vital human goal. Some people have more natural skill for it than others, but all of us can aspire. It's another word for a very important dimension of love. And love is, is, is the centerpiece of much Christian theology. If, if love, if empathy, if commitment to peace are there, then that will require anyone who's dealing with conflict to, to seek for opportunities for dialogue. And dialogue is a central dimension of, of peace building. And peace building can be in the form of uh, mediation, uh, or it can be in the form of um, simply uh, negotiation. It can also move on to a stage of, of arbitration in some, in some cases. But, but um, the, those, those qualities of human relationships, of empathy and love and dialogue, are central dimensions. Uh, of peace. I think perhaps that's probably enough of an introduction, David, and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to talk. So thank you. And thank you very much, John. So we're going to have about five minutes of discussions now about things that John said or other things that people want to say. So if you have a question or a comment, can you please uh, put your hand up or start talking, whatever's easier? John, can I ask you a question? Um, oh, actually, we'll let Andrew go first. Andrew, go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir, from Bangladesh, LCM. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can, clearly, thank you. Okay, yeah. Actually, we are getting fear, we are remaining in fear. We are very much fear about Ukraine and Russia war. Uh, actually, we are praying, Bangladesh, LCM, and we also pray. So my question is, uh, does Australia play any role for this situation? Like especially Australian government and people of Australia, does they play any role for stopping this war? Or uh, yes, this is my question. And the answer is very little, I'm ashamed to say, Andrew, at, at present, we have a government that addresses conflict by increasing military expenditure. And, and the conflict that, that uh, the present government is most aware of is its conflict with China. And what does, what does uh, the present government do? It, it increases its own expenditure on, on, on uh, the military, on on weapons and on employing more soldiers, sailors, and air people. Uh, it also gives strong attention to strengthening its, its relationship with the United States, but it puts very little emphasis, I'm ashamed to say, uh, in, into seeking conflict resolution, uh, peace building, attempting peace building. And it, an example of this is that it's, it's halved the proportion of its own expenditure, which is spent on diplomats. If, if a government wants to build up peaceful relations, it has to have a, a generously funded and highly professional uh, group of, of diplomats building on relationships with other countries, building up relationships with other countries. And Australia has been cutting that, that proportion of its expenditure on diplomats. So I'm ashamed to say uh, that Australia has mostly done relatively little in the last decade of a, of a peace building kind. It has, however, in certain situations, played a useful role. When there was a protest in Bougainville about the copper mine there, 
and there was a fierce a conflict within the, the island. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, and several other Pacific countries joined together and, and worked with the conflicting parties there in Bougainville. Uh, they sent in uh, peace builders from each of the countries, not just Australia, but New Zealand and Fiji and, and et cetera as well. And, and without arms, with, with no arms, no weapons. And, and, and they negotiated, that contributed substantially to negotiating an, uh, an, an end to that, that conflict in relation to conflict in the Solomon Islands. Uh, they, they, Australia sent in troops to stop the, the violence and they did su succeed in stopping the violence very quickly, but they didn't succeed in, in solving the problem that was driving the violence. Um, so Australia has a lot to learn. Uh, and the, the center that I work with is trying to strengthen understanding of that and urge increased expenditure on diplomacy, on, on dialogue, on training of diplomats in, in peace building technique so that we can uh, try and be more active in this internationally. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Did anyone else have any uh, questions or comments? So you can write them down if you prefer. Remember, there's no question too silly. Anything you want to say, please say. I'd be very interested to hear people talk about a little, if they would, if they would care to do so, about the conflict between Bangladesh and and Pakistan and and Bangladesh and and India. Um, uh, it, 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 there is a history of that which hasn't been much expressed. I'm glad to say recently, but it's, but the the, the residue of that conflict is still there. Very tough questions. Um, so we'll we'll shift now if no one has any uh, questions, uh, and we will get back to John. We'll we'll get an answer to that for you, John. Um, oh, we have. If there's no one who has any questions, if you do think of something, please let us know. If not, I'll now shift to Monica, who will help to kind of facilitate the next part of this uh, discussion, which we'll be hearing from our speakers. And the first one will be from um, SCM Bangladesh. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, uh, today, uh, now we have our another friend, uh, Ms. Chung Fiu Fan Fanny. She is Regional Executive for Asia Pacific Region and Global uh, Program Director. I would like to request Fanny to share about what the WCP is doing for making peace. Fanny, over to you, please. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. hello. So good to see you. Yeah, people, good to see you. Huh? Yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry that because I'm still on 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 the way home, so I can't switch on my 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 camera. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you for organizing this uh very good initiative, like to SEM uh, having the same interest on uh the topic on peace. Uh, actually, WSF Asia Pacific uh has been evolving with uh this issue for many years. Uh, actually, we have a uh, uh, a program, probably many of you will know that it's called uh, Human Rights, Justice and Peace uh, program. Uh, in the regional level, actually, we also have the committee. Uh, Monica is one of the uh, uh, Human Rights, Justice and Peace uh, committee members serving until next RCM. So uh, we have been concerning these uh, issues. And then uh, uh, many of you, I think you have joined uh, the program before, the HRJP uh, program, which uh, in the past, mostly we have it uh, every year, uh, uh, studying different topics on uh, sometimes human rights, sometimes peace, 
uh, the last uh, human rights program, I think, should be in 2018 in Korea. That is the peace uh, 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 related issue on the Korean Peninsula. So I think some of the movement they send the delegates to Korea there. And then that should be the last uh, human rights program for uh, Asia Pacific region. So after that, probably because of the, you know, the COVID uh, uh, broke and then it's still ongoing. So that's why we cannot at all the, uh, uh, organize any in-person uh, human rights programs, which is a, a week long uh, workshop. Usually we will study the issue there and then there will be also an exposure. Uh, to all the delegates, and they will come up with action plan and some statement at the end of the work. We might have lost you there, Fanny. We can hear you clearly, Fanny. Uh, uh, uh -huh. Hello. Is it, is it good now? A little better, yes. No. Uh, we can have no, another. Uh, hello? It just broke in. Uh, That's okay. Sorry, Fanny. We'll move on. But I think the really important thing that Fanny said was that there is a program out there. So there are practical things that we can do. Uh, uh, sorry, Monica, go ahead. Okay, Fanny. Uh, thank you very much for your sharing. Now, I would like to request our another speaker, uh, Paula Brigitte Halder. She is from Bangladesh SCM. She is a chairperson of Bangladesh SCM Kulna Unit. She will share about peacemaking and our responsibility, especially uh, what is doing from Bangladesh SCM. So Paula, over to you. You have five minutes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. Okay. Uh, so I think you all are uh, doing well by God grace and uh, thanks to Australia SCM and Bangladesh SCM for recognizing such a thoughtful context in this uh, pandemic or in this situation. So let me share about my thought of process in the current state of peacemaking. So let me share with you all. So according to me, peace is a concept of societal friendship and harmony in the absence of hostility and violence. And in that circumstances, in that person, what is peacemaking? So for me, peacemaking is an intervention in a violent conflict to attempt for negotiate a peace agreement. So the current situation of my community in peacemaking. So firstly, the first one that I recognized that passing the exhausting zip for pandemic. And the second one, which is terribly faced for is stabbing on financial status and the political violence, then violence towards Oman. Complication between several communities and last but not the least, religious conflict. So the challenges to making peace in our church. So in our church, there is a sometimes serious disagreement in our interchurch. And the second one that I recognize and I feel for the very terrific way is variation of decision. And then the lackings of fraternity, 
lack of equality, conflict in interdetermination, and lastly, power conflict. So what is the challenges to make peace in our community? Violent political aspects, and then addiction towards drugs, and the lack of integrating leadership, absence of networking, and community variance, and also religious conflict. So the steps has taken by Bangladesh SCM to overcome the peace building obstacles. So firstly, Bangladesh SCM is working with to make durable networking and a Bible study on peacemaking. And uh, for a very reason, help the unprivileged one and then making awareness about consequences of violence, making awareness about drug addiction to youths, utilize the potential leaders, and trying hard to turn off community variance and educated students and the community to reduce religious conflict, operate with interfaith dialogue and operate about human rights. And also sometimes uh, post on social media for promoting peace and then invite a peace a speaker to conduct different workplaces, seminars, cultural movements at the church, university and community level. And then start collection to donate for a charity and also advocating on eco justice and lastly continuing advocating action to make peace so my responsibility for overcoming peace obstacles so there is the first one that i believe is renew renew the current status of our society refresh to refresh all sort of negativity to renew the it means i am trying to conflict with prejudice for our society where the society still holds the mending of roots which uh, doesn't make any purpose then and refresh to refresh the matter which is meant to be cursing our place and lastly maintain to maintain the values of our culture society and economical state and by maintain the right way of our culture uh, the possibility of build up peace in our society um, would have increased on it and also uh, in our economical statement. So that's the thing that I believe that if we really work on it all over again, so we could really evenly make it out that I hardly believe. So uh, this is for today that I have uh, very little time to explore. So thank you so much for bear with me and making the effort to hear me. So thank you. Thank you very much, Paula, for your sharing. It's really amazing. Uh, uh, dear friends, we just request all of you, if you have any reflection or question, we have uh, another slot that is open discussion. So that time you can share your experience, share your reflection. But now we have another speaker. Uh, I would like to invite our friend, Rachel Anthony, uh, a student member of Australia Student Christian Movement. Uh, Rachel Anthony will speak about what Australia SCM is doing for peace. So uh, Rachel, over to you. This is your time. So we have five minutes for you. Please, Rachel. Good evening, members of the Bangladesh and Australian Student Christian Movement. 
My name is Rachel Anthony and I'm a liaison officer for the Australian Student Christian Movement, as well as a student at the University of Queensland. Today, I will be discussing one of the Australian Student Christian Movement's current peace building projects, as well as potential initiatives the organisation could pursue to further build peace in Australia and overseas. Presently, the Australian Student Christian Movement is working to provide peace education in schools with a pilot project being run in an Anglican school. In a recent discussion I took part in, we talked about how unfortunately many people do not see building peace as their responsibility. As a result, providing education on the value of peace building is important for changing this perception and convincing more Christians to become invested in seeking peace. Educational programs like this also inform students on what specifically they can do to support peace building. There are several other peace building projects taking place in Australia. In the future, the Australian Student Christian Movement look at working with and supporting some of the other groups that are striving for peace in the country and on a global level. In addition to being terrible in and of itself, poverty can lead to conflict through increasing people's desperation to support themselves. In Australia, there are numerous anti-poverty groups the Australian Student Christian Movement could become involved with. TIA Fund is one Christian organisation dedicated to responding to poverty and social injustice in a variety of ways. This organisation's projects include providing educational resources to churches, fundraising and facilitating local groups acting against poverty and injustice. The Australian Student Christian Movement could assist TIA Fund's efforts through circulating information about its multiple social justice groups and fundraising efforts to the Australian population to try to increase awareness and subsequently support for these efforts. Ill health is but one factor that can contribute to poverty through creating stress and preventing people from earning money through working. The Christian organisation Mission Australia runs many social justice programs, including initiatives to help members of the community struggling with their mental health. Mission Australia has fundraising projects in place to partner with churches and corporations so the Australian Student Christian Movement could aid the charity by finding both organisations and churches willing to connect with and support Mission Australia. Seeking gender equality can initially support peace building throughout the world. Violence against women and girls is obviously not peaceful, so improving the living conditions and status of the world's female population is important both in and of itself and to, include, and to improve global peace. An organisation seeking to improve gender equality is the WCA, formerly known as the, oh, sorry, the, an organisation seeking to improve gender equality is the YWCA, formerly known as the Young Women's Christian Association. The Australian branch of the YWCA has housing and, prog housing and program initiatives for women facing and at risk of homelessness. One project run by the YWCA is an online advocacy initiative in which participants collectively post on the internet to raise awareness of gender equality and feminism. Because this event takes place virtually, member, members of the Australian Student Christian Movement could join in to support the YWCA's efforts for gender equality and subsequently peace building. On an international scale, numerous religious groups from a range of faiths are official partners of the United Nations. The non-government faith-based organisations play a part in the decision-making processes of the United States for both global issues concerning religious defamation specifically, as well as for issues of peace and conflict around the world. One example of the impact of faith-based organisations' involvement was when several partnered Christian and Muslim organisations supported the United Nations Development Programme in halting the spread of HIV AIDS in the Middle East. The Australian Student Christian Movement could support individual faith-based organisations' peace-building efforts. For example, Caritas Australia is a Christian-based organisation that works with the United Nations, but it also runs independent fundraising for peace-building. Caritas Australia relies on volunteers for its fundraising projects, so members of the Australian Student Christian Movement could become involved in some of Caritas Australia's short-term programs projects. To summarise, both the Australian Student Christian Movement and other organisations have initiated projects to 
with the aim of building peace in Australia and throughout the world. However, it is important to consider how these projects can expand and how collaborations can create new initiatives to further foster peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for your brilliant sharing. It's really very uh, uh, informative. Uh, today, we are really very lucky that we have a senior friend in this platform. And also, we have now our former uh, chairperson of WSFAP, uh, Kekadi, also here. And now, this is time for our another speaker. Uh, Prince Shanjoy Shaha. He is our uh, senior friend of Bangladesh SCM. At the same time, he was uh, uh, was the uh, former uh, 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 general secretary of Bangladesh SCM. But now he is working in many development sector. Uh, now I am requesting Mr. Prince to share your uh, sharing. He will discuss about the context of peace in Bangladesh and also uh, share how SCM can continue and contribute to making peace. So now over to you, Mr. Shanjoy. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. And uh, I'm really thankful to you and uh, David for inviting me. Uh, from, uh, Professor uh, John Langmore, thank you very much for joining us today. And also I thank you, Robbie and uh, Keka Odhikari, our former WCFAP president uh, at this moment. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here. And just to introduce myself in brief, I was, uh, I started ACM uh, back in 1993 when I was a student and it's been 30 years now <laughs> almost. Uh, and I have been a senior friend long ago in Bangladesh. I have served as the as the National General Secretary of Bangladesh SCM, and uh, I have uh, served as the. We have a big senior friend forum. That's a loose forum, but uh, it's uh, quite strong. And uh, I served there also as the secretary. So uh, I'm still involved, uh, but. Uh, well, Today, I'm more like a development professional. Today, uh, when we think about uh, peace building and uh, when Professor uh, Langmuir was sharing about uh, current, really, uh, not religious, political conflict of Ukraine and Russia, it, uh, it has big impact in Bangladesh. Everything, every religious, uh, and political wave that comes on us strongly. The rush comes on us uh, in, in, in media uh, and in social media. And sometimes uh, in social media, especially sometimes it is so attacking and disturbing that gives us uh, uh, a kind of threat to the minority. And when we are talking about peace building here, uh, being a minority and talking about peace is something very different than being a majority in the country and talking about peace. Being a majority that feels like, okay, I have my support, I have everything, and I am inviting a, a, a weak person or a weaker, weaker, weaker team to make peace. But when we are, as minority, talk about it, it feels like we are being more submissive. So, um, and we have to compromise uh, being a minority. I'm, I'm talking about not only my perspective, but also when you talk about uh, indigenous people's perspective and also ethnic minorities and a lot of religious minorities, ethical minorities, those, are, those have the same, same feeling. And uh, building peace, being a minority is, is different. And as I said, like when you have the wave, I have the rush of, of every political and religious wave in the country that is happening anywhere in the world. Uh, we need to face that very peacefully. And today, if we talk about how we make peace, we make peace uh, being like Jesus, to be honest. Like uh, uh, when we see that we have an attack on social media or in media or the, uh, by the people outside, out there. We, 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 
uh, think like, okay, as Jesus said, they are doing a lot of things without knowing what they are doing. It, it is because sometimes people attack and they don't understand how much it hurts uh, when you are a minority, how much your words, your deeds may hurt another person or another community. Sometimes people don't understand and we need to forgive that and say, hey, come on, this is not right. So think differently. And uh, uh, we cannot fight with them. We cannot go and make another conflict from, from the beginning that what they have started uh, like a conflict. So uh, making peace, building peace and staying in harmony to us is more like uh, being, being like Jesus. And when we talk about being like Jesus, we do this everywhere, everywhere, because uh, you may know that Christianity, uh, number of Christian people may be 0.04% in Bangladesh, which is fourth microscopic minority in the country. Uh, that sounds crazy, but <laughs> it is true. <laughs> and um, it is reducing. Uh, and um, so reducing means you're losing more strength. But we have one thing, one strong point with us is where we have Christian people, we have uh, the best people. Christian people are the best people in the country. We have the best, uh, when you talk about uh, one hospital or clinic in one district, in one area, that's a Christian hospital. When you talk about the, the school and colleges, the best school or colleges in the area is a Christian college or, or school. So where we are, we serve, in the name of God. Where we are, we have our identity uh, as the best people of the area. So that is that is a very strong point. And for peacemaking, it helps us a lot that we do not fight, we live like Jesus, we can forgive, we are honest. So uh, that is how the, uh, the peacemaking uh, things affect from the minority um, uh, point of view in, in Bangladesh. I don't take much of your time, but uh, sometimes it is um, for us, like any anything, uh, any any religious or political action that is happening in the, in the world comes to us. And we know that there are over 90% people who are um, unknowingly motivated or demotivated by some other other belief or, or, or mentality. So we have to stay calm at, at any situation and face the reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Prince, for your excellent sharing. It's really very helpful and informative for us. And I think we have many reflection in our mind. So don't worry, very soon we will open our open discussion session. Before that, we have another speaker. So I would like to request jo uh, uh, Jody Payne, uh, a student speaker from Australia SCM. So this is your time, Jody. Hi, everyone. I'll just share my screen. I've got a brief PowerPoint. Just checking you can all see that properly. Wonderful. All right, I'll try to make this brief. My presentation is, isn't as focused on topical political issues. It's more just like a brief overview of what the Bible says about peace. So I'll be mainly focusing on a couple of key Bible verses and just discussing them quite briefly. So to start off with, the Bible has a huge emphasis on spiritual peace, and this is at the center of the gospel. Um, Romans 5 talks about how we, are, we have peace with God. We know that we are justified by faith in Jesus. And because of that, we can stand before him peacefully, knowing that we've been made righteous. Or in John 16, we, this is when um, Jesus is speaking to his disciples just before he um, um, ascends to heaven. And he tells them, in me, you may have peace. We know that in this world, we may have trouble, but we have spiritual peace in our hearts, knowing that the world has been overcome. But that isn't limited to just individual peace. Because we have spiritual peace in our hearts, we're also called to live peaceably as one body in Christ. 
So Colossians 3 draws a really clear link between the peace of Christ in our hearts and being members of one body. And for this, we're always thankful. Ephesians 4 as well emphasizes how we have unity of the spirit. Again, this is through the peace we have with God. And 2 Corinthians as well talks about how we live as brothers and sisters rejoicing. It talks about restoration, encouragement, living in peace as children of God, the God of love and peace. And we can see that even though this um, may not match up with the political idea of peace, which we might think about here on earth, having peace among us as believers is a way in which we can enjoy the peace which comes from God. It's also a way for us to demonstrate our peace, our spiritual peace, to those around us who don't know Jesus. For example, Matthew 5, not on the slide, but Matthew 5 talks about how we live as if we're a light on, on a hill, shining for others to see the good deeds of God. So the peace we have among us as a body of believers, as one body, is a way in which we can show the glory of the gospel to those around us. So again, peace is not just limited to us within a body of believers or as the church. We're also called to live peaceably among all. Romans 12 talks about how we do not repay anyone evil for evil. And if possible, we live peaceably with all. Hebrews 12 as well emphasizes how we make every effort to live in peace with everyone. So we can see that it's not just limited to, um, to other believers or our own hearts. It's also us making an effort, if possible, to live at peace with all around us in society. So this practically looks like treating others with love and gentleness, as I think it was Mr. Sanjay just earlier brought up how peace looks like living like Jesus. So Titus 3 talks about really practical applications, such as being subject to rulers, obedient, doing what is good, not slandering, gentleness, Uh, Jerry, we can hear you clearly. Oh, we might have lost J Jody. We'll just get a few more seconds in case that the uh, signal comes back. A bit better. There we go. All right, hopefully I can make it through. Second last slide, I promise. I'll just repeat what I said a, a moment ago. So Matthew 5, Jesus challenges the idea of loving our neighbor but hating our enemy. And he emphasizes we love our enemies, both the evil and the good, the righteous and the unrighteous. That's the peace which we, with which we serve others. And so we can see that this falls under ultimately the two greatest commandments. First, we love the Lord our God with all our heart, giving thanks all the time for our spiritual peace for him and his son. And secondly, we love our neighbour. This spiritual peace naturally flows outwards towards not only the church, but towards all around us. Right, that's it for me. Thank you so yeah. much for that, Jody. That was amazing. Um, as Monica said, this will we'll have a group discussion now. So thank you to all the speakers. Now I need to ask uh, if anyone has any comments about what they heard, any questions, please ask. Put your hand up, write a comment. Robbie, you have? Yes, I, I'd just be eager to ask our friends in Bangladesh, SCM, uh, to speak about a, a couple of issues in Bangladesh. Uh, firstly, uh, what it's like to be, uh, be Christians as a small minority faith in, in a, a society where uh, Islam is the, uh, the dominant religion. And, uh, and then there's the relationships both with the uh, Hindu community uh, in India, but also with the, uh, the Buddhist community in uh, Myanmar. So this, these challenges of, of intercultural relations are quite significant for Bangladesh. And I, I, I just really appreciate some thoughts from Bangladesh SCM on, on these issues. Who would like to field that question? Monica? Okay, I think uh, before there, Sanjay can uh, contribute here and then me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ravi, for asking this question. Actually, I was highlighting on some of the issues as uh, uh, being minority in the country. It's uh, 
as I mentioned, the two year, the, the fourth microscopic minority in the country. And uh, there are Hindus who are also a minority um, uh, religion in the country. We have Buddhist, once we said that Buddhist are 1% in the country, but maybe that also reduced to point something. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the question is about how, how it feels. It really feels sometimes scary when there are uh, fundamental, religious fundamental issues break out. And uh, also a government try to control everything, uh, uh, every bad thing that may happen. And I'm really thankful to Bangladesh government that Bangladesh government has uh, done a lot to, to control the religious fundamentalism in the country. And they have tried to save the minorities. There are a lot of issues happened here and there, uh, especially uh, there, are, there were many attacks on, on Hindus and uh, in temples on public Hindu people. Uh, but uh, those are, are um, sometimes planned uh, to create some chaos in the country. And, and you know, the religious matters are the most sensitive issues uh, that easy to create chaos. So people take that opportunity. Some people take that opportunity also. But uh, when uh, there are issues in India, uh, uh, there are fights between uh, Hindus and Muslims that wave comes to us also. So, and we see a lot of things on social media. A lot of, lot of chaos, a lot of crisis, a lot of attacks uh, from both parties. Uh, those are like, uh, as I said, like we, we, we stay calm and pray for those people and say, okay, Jesus said that we need to be very careful um, and, uh, and polite, polite like pigeons and uh, careful like snakes. And we, if we want to make peace, we have to be like calm and cool and uh, look at Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just if I say about the Bangladesh movement, how we are responding about the issue. So peacemaking and religious conflict and the discussion dialogue is our uh, one of the major agenda in here in Bangladesh SCM. So we are continuing advocating about the issue and also conducting many seminar uh, workshop in person or roundtable discussion with different denominations people, how we can lead our life in, in li as like a friendly, not any conflict between another, any other religion. So that's also our regular uh, advocacy here, how to overcome this situation in Bangladesh, especially community where we are now working. So that's all. If anyone from Bangladesh SM would like to respond, you can share. Otherwise, we can move another question. May I take uh, just one minute to share my views? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, just one thing. I think uh, 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 Shanjoy, the Prince, uh, and Monica already share many things, but I just want to share one thing from the woman's perspective. Uh, how, as a Christian, we are living in, uh, you know, as a minority in this country. So, uh, what I can tell in university and the, uh, uh, in the office and outside house, we found find that is nowadays there is a trend among the Muslim community, among the female of the Muslim community, they are using hijab and they are covering all over their, uh, you know, bodies uh, with uh, with black dress. So the thing is, uh, that is when uh, people easily can identify that is you are from other faith. When you are working in an office and every woman wearing the hijab and you are not using, people can understand. Same thing uh, is in the university and college and schools. And earlier in our time, when we uh, used to be a student of university and college, that's, that time, almost there was nobody used to, they, they used that uh, hijab, but now they are using. So. Uh, most of the time it is a feeling for my personal and present uh, experience I can say that is uh, you are different people can understand that you are different so you have to be very much careful to talk to your male colleagues and when I find that is when I work with my uh, you know uh, you know female colleagues or uh, male people from our
official skin, well, they don't want to to you if you're not covered. And they feel that if they talk to you, uh, maybe it is not good or other people can blame them or something. This type of is there. So this issues, what I feel that we is now, you know, do this losing how uh, was before. I think we might have lost you there, sorry. It is. Uh, there is another thing we called it was the Sorry, the sound isn't very good. We've we've lost you there. I do apologize, but we did hear most of it. Thank you so much for sharing. Did anyone have anything else they would like to ask uh, any of the speakers or any comments they'd like to make? Please feel free to to ask anything you'd like. If not, I'll get Monica to introduce um, the person that will do the closing prayer for us. Thank you so much. Actually, we are very end of our this webinar because time is really running out. Thank you very much, all of you, for your uh, uh, participation here. Now, I would like to request our friend uh, Shati Mary Barui. She is a student from Bangladesh SM. Also, she is the executive committee member of Bangladesh SM Central Committee. So please uh, 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 continue the uh, the closing pair of this session. Shati Meribari, over to you, please. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you all. Now let's we pray. Oh God, you are our savior. Thank you God for keeping us well and healthy. Today we are all together because you have blessed us. Let us remember what we have discussed together today. Our Lord, have peace in this world. You always increase the sense of responsibility in all of us. May we take care of this world and make brotherly love with every country. You bless the CM. May we all work for you. Now also pray for Australia and Bangladesh. We also pray for Ukraine and Russia. May peace be established in them. Also pray for WSCF and others movement so that they can carry on their activities smoothly. Lord, you set us free from the COVID-19. We believe you are always with us all. I give all our prayers to you. Amen. 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 Thank you so much to all of you for joining, for speaking, for listening, for, to contributing. I never want to take these things for granted. I know some of us sometimes Zoom with lots of people, so I just want us to sort of take a moment to really appreciate uh, the moment that we could all come together uh, like this. So thank you all so much uh, for joining. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for the inspiration. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, take care. Yeah, thank you for a wonderful word. Thank you.